This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, life on the farm. The horse farm, that is. Just across the highway from this Indiana prison is this home for retired racehorses, where inmates from the prison work to get the thoroughbreds and themselves ready for new lives. I got a few favorites out here that I like. Usually it's the ones that are the most temperamental. Good job! It's like a tower. And it's fall, so this must be orchard time. Families headed to the country, grabbing apples and memories. And you see them in hometowns across Indiana, not just for the fairway anymore. Golf carts as small town transportation. In this town, they're everywhere. We have tons of golf carts in here. I think everybody in town has a golf cart. We start today on another street in another town. This could actually be so many places in Indiana because so many places the story is the same. In the big mortgage crisis of a few years ago, Indiana actually led the country in mortgage foreclosures. There's a ripple effect when that happens. Foreclosed homes become vacant homes, become blighted neighborhoods. The response in many places has been to tear down some of those homes and Muncie has slated dozens for demolition. But there's a concern that Muncie could lose part of its history through that. And so there's a move now to save some of the city's historic properties. Brad King is Muncie's historic preservation officer. We're in the Old West End neighborhood. The Old West End is literally the Old West portion of Muncie. Muncie used to go to about the river and that was the west, this is the west end of Muncie at that time, hence the name Old West End. A lot of these houses kind of date back to about the 1870s to 1890s and then 1900 really proliferates a lot of architecture through the Old West End. There's plenty of history in Muncie's homes. On the east side of downtown, places like the Emily Kimbrough Historic District were the neighborhoods of Muncie's business owners. On the west end, meanwhile, were the managers, foreman, and the regular folks who worked in those businesses. So you have a really economically, socially mixed uh, group of housing and families that were living in the Old West End, not too different than you have today. So you have some really big, high Victorian uh, style homes, Queen Anne's, 3,500 square feet. And then you have some cottages, like 1,200 square feet. And they're just a block apart a block apart. So imagine you're a worker li working in a, let's say, a Kitzelman steel fact, steel and wire, and your foreman lives a block away from you. Today's version of that economic diversity could be someone like Edwin Ramos, a transplant from New York who's bought the historic RM Ball House on West Charles Street in the Old West End. I have a couple of friends of mine here living in Indiana, right here in Muncie in particular. Um, they said to me, um, are you sure you want to live in here when now everything is available? I say, you know, I'm looking for a quiet place, something that is peaceful with friendly people, family oriented. And that's what I found in Muncie. And everybody here is polite. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. And that took my heart. Ramos, a native of Puerto Rico, says he looked at more than 250 houses before settling on this Queen Anne style built in 1891 by members of the Ball family. This house inside is completely Victorian, has its original wood, original fireplace. Uh, most of the renovations that has been done, they try to preserve what is inside. That's not easy. Take a 3,500 square foot, 124 year old home, and you can imagine the maintenance issues alone. When we visited, a crew was painting the outside of the house, cost, Ramos says, $14,000. That's not including restoration to the woodwork, repairs to the chimney, new windows, or other big ticket items the home will need. Ramos wishes that people like him who are fixing up these houses could get low interest loans or other support. In fact, 
The city has more than 4,000 empty or abandoned properties. Muncie's Neighborhood Investment Committee is looking for urban homesteaders who can buy an abandoned house at low cost in exchange for a promise to fix it up and live there. Ramos says he can identify with people willing to put in that kind of sweat equity. That's what I'm doing, you know. It's hard, but I'm telling you, at the end of the road, it pay you off because you will feel proud. You will feel proud that you did it, that, that you made something that other people can admire and see, hey, I mean, look old, but when it's done, it's going to be beautiful. Muncie, like plenty of other Rust Belt cities, has had to make tough choices about what abandoned properties should be torn down and which should be saved. It's easy to look at an abandoned home that has broken windows and maybe even a bad roof and say, nah, no one's going to do anything like that and tear it down. But it it's a little bit harder to find people with vision and patience to say, no, I'm going to invest in the house and turn it around. So the key is to how do we prioritize that? And so one of the ways that I've been working with the city as the historic preservation officer is to prioritize those houses that have the best character, architectural characteristics, but also have the cultural history of who lived there. Was it a pioneer of Muncie? Was it a mover and shaker during the turn of the 20th century of Muncie? Then let's deprioritize those houses for demolition and let's get some of these other houses that people are interested in and bring them down. And let's find ways to put families back in these houses and get them rehabbed. King spoke while standing in a new community park built on the site of a former home. It's an example of reusing space that was formerly blighted. There was a uh, Victorian Queen Anne home built at the end of the Victorian era, about 1900. It was about two and a half stories, and eventually during its 100-year reign, it became five units. King says he's heard from developers who want to do more rehabs in the neighborhood, including someone who wants to work on the Wilmore Apartments across the street. This was a doctor's office and apartments building. Most people, I think, will remember it as Planned Parenthood from the 90s, the 80s and 90s, and the turn of the millennia and now it's empty. It's not necessarily blighted, it's kept secure, but it's empty. And someone wants to repurpose this for a, a, a type of uh, live workspace. And that's the type of repurposing that we would love to see happen, not just in the Old West, and not just in historic districts, but in different areas that have been hit the same way. And a lot of it, it ha unfortunately, is historic areas that have been hit this way and are close to downtown. Ramos says his neighborhood had its trouble with crime, but it's gotten a lot better the past couple of years. He's told friends from around the country that Muncie is the place to be. What happened happened, but past two years has been getting better. And I said, people across the United States, come to Muncie, come to here. You will never get out. You will never get out from here because it has so much charm has so many pretty things. Only you need a little TLC, that's all. Just a TLC in your heart, no more. There's something about rehabilitating these homes, maybe in the idea of rehabilitation itself, a required kind of hopefulness that makes it seem worthwhile. You might make the same connection in our next story, in the rehabilitation of retired racehorses. State prisons are looking for ways to help inmates find jobs when they leave in hopes that fewer will return. Among the training programs out there is an eight-year-old effort at the Putnam Correctional Facility west of Indianapolis. Inmates there are working with retired racehorses, helping retrain them so the thoroughbreds can find new homes. The horse barn is across the highway from the main prison, but it seems so far from the razor wire fences and guard towers it's a horse barn, after all, staffed by low-risk inmates who know they've got a great assignment. Mike Raines is an assistant superintendent who oversees the program. It is very different over here. You know, you don't have all the fences, you don't have the guard towers, you don't have, you know, all the uh, uniformed officers around. Um, you know, you come back here, it is a more relaxed setting. Um, you know, we do, like I said, have the level one offenders out here, three level one offenders, but it is a more relaxing environment. Not that the inmates are coddled over at the barn, but Reigns makes the point that 97% of all inmates will eventually be released. So it only makes sense to try to get them job ready for when they go. 
everybody makes mistakes. Um, these guys, you know, that come here, uh, maybe they made some poor choices, but you know, once they're released, we're going to help them, you know, re-enter society and make them employable. The things that we can we can do, um, you know, instead of being a, a burden on the state, is actually turn these into taxpayers out there and when they're getting employed. James Harrison is one of the inmate leaders of the program. This is probably the best experience that I've had being incarcerated. Um, it's probably the best job that they have here. I get along pretty well with everybody here, and, and we all get along pretty well, so. What are the horses like? Um, well, I mean, they're thoroughbred horses. They're, they're pretty hyper. Some of them are um, a little on the, on the touchy side. Um, they don't like to be bothered or messed with, and but they go along with the program too, just like just like us. Um, there, there's some I got a few favorites out here that I like. Usually, it's the ones that are the most temperamental, or the ones that I like the most, and the one, ones that's got a little bit of action to them. I mess with the ones um, like Alley Cat and Love Ya. I, I know you've never met them, but they're a little bit more hyper or temperamental. So I, I like messing with those guys. Tell me about Alley Cat. Um, Alley Cat, he's a he's an older thoroughbred. He is the biggest horse out here. He's a uh, 17 hands tall, which is pretty tall. I mean, and he's a lot bigger than you, right? Yeah, bigger than me. You kind of have to respect that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like today, he was a little temperamental. Today, I, I went in to try to pat him and. You know, he, he let me know that he didn't want to be petted, so I kind of How did they got do that? Um, well, they, for starters, they let you know by, they, they pin their ears back. And then the next step will be that they'll nip you. They don't really bite you, but they'll nip you. And then the next step is he likes to jump over with his butt and uh, get sideways on you. And whenever he gets sideways on you, that means he's about ready to raise his leg up to kick you. And then you know you're in a little bit of trouble. So you know, I've had him do that a couple of times. Uh, once out there in the field, the first time he ever did it, I, I thought he was going to kill me, but uh, we came to we came to an agreement. So, but yeah, he's he, he's my favorite. Terry Russ is coordinator for the equine program and says the men can earn a certificate qualifying them for jobs caring for horses. They learn general barn maintenance, how to groom a horse. They learn about anatomy. Uh, everything you know from top to bottom. They learn about feet, uh, digestive system, legs, bandaging, uh, shed row safety. Whatever the program offers the inmates, it's very much a second chance for the horses. When their careers somehow come to an abrupt halt due to an, any kind of injury or um, they're, they're not winning any money any longer or <laughs> they're not useful to the, to the uh, racehorse industry, Unfortunately, then, a, a, a lot of times they were sent to um, slaughterhouses, either to Mexico or to Canada. The Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, which sponsors the inmate training, helps find new homes for the horses. In the meantime, they get good care at the barn. The horses that we have out here, they're taken care of seven days a week. We, um, you know, it's a seven day a week operation to come out here and feed them. We try to get them out and groom them three and four days a week. Uh, by doing that, uh, some of the guys here create a really close bond with these horses. You know, um, when, when the guys get out here, um, initially, 99% of them have never been around a horse before in their life. Uh, these horses aren't your average backyard pony. They're great big, you know, pretty massive beast. And, um, you know, uh, they teach the inmates sometimes, and then, you know, we try to retrain the inmates to, to kind of bring them back around. And we always want to be the herd leader. You know, we want the horses to feel safe, and we want everybody working with them to be safe. George Schuler has been working at the barn for a year. He says you do have to be careful. Well, I wear a brace because they'll, you know, you got a thousand pound plus horse pulling one way when you want to go the other way. Uh, they'll nip at you. They'll kick at you. Like I said, they've uh, spent the first multiple years of their lives in a stall 23 hours a day, except for, you know, race day. And, uh, and now they get out here and they get in their herd mentality and left that way for a while. And I don't know if horses revert back any, but I think they get comfortable where they're at and you want them to do something else and they don't want to. Uh, 
it can be a challenge. The experience is something special both for the horses, used to being cooped up in their stalls, and inmates used to being cooped up behind walls. It's the freedom aspect out here and uh, the trust factor. You know, they have to trust you to be here. But even though we are uh, a minimum security level in custody, we're as low as you can be, we are one out custody, which means we could work at the governor's house if he wanted us there. So we're more trusting, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a rat race in there, you know, because you got all walks of life and all different ages. And uh, you know, you might be on a top bunk and there's a 19-year-old kid on the bottom bunk and sleep next to him. The guy might have 23 years in for murder and the guy on top of him was a habitual driving offender. So, like I said, just all mix and everything. And just like with the military, you know, personalities clash and that. And to be able to come out here, it's just, just you know, like you leave that all behind. Elsewhere in the country, it's fall, and that means the season for apple orchards. We visited the Jacobs family orchard north of Newcastle, where they were sorting some of the crop, making cider, and even donuts. Kim Smith and her daughter Lindsay were visiting from Anderson. I like coming out, trying the different apples with my mom, and bringing out my nephews to the little um, bounce houses and jungle gym that they have over there, climbing on the different hays that they have and just having a good time with them and spending that quality time with my family. I'd say it's a fun, interesting learning experience to see what the different apples are, what it takes to make those apples, and really figuring out what type of apple you really like. Like many orchard goers, Lindsay is serious about her apples. There's ones that are sweet and crisp, tart and crisp, or you have an apple that's either sweet or tart and really soft. Um, you have to figure out which one you like the best if you want a tart apple, which is what I like, and I like them to be crisp like the Zestar apples. Kim Smith says there's a difference between store-bought apples and the ones she finds at orchards. The taste is 100% better. <laughs> Tastes like a real apple, and, and they're, they're ripe when you buy them. You don't have to let them set out. They, you know, they're already ripe when you buy them, ready to eat. Tastes good. Price is good. A tip for orchard visitors, try a couple varieties to see what you like. I think you need to try the apples to see which one you like best. And our favorite for the early season is the Zesters, which is a, a tart, crisp apple. Um, but then we like the Molly Delicious, which is a sweet, you know, crisp apple. And some are good for, for cooking and some are just good for eating. The Cortlands are a wonderful uh, apple. It's one of our favorites. They're great for eating and cooking. They kind of get mushy, you know. but. Um, they're, they're probably one of the better eating apples, in our opinion. <laughs> Wayne Jacobs runs the business with his family. When he gets a rare break during this busy season, you can sometimes find him on the front porch of his house next door. 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was just a retail apple business. The folks that owned it just bagged up apples and sold them and made some cider, and that was it. And it's, it's turned into more of an attraction, more of a, a family event. The apples aren't the only thing anymore. Wayne, who also grows corn and soybeans, says apples are a very tough crop. By trade, prior to this, I was a, a grain farmer, corn, beans, cattle, hogs. That's, those crops are kind of stable and, and predictable, and apples are much more variable, weather dependent, temperature dependent. Just, a, just appears, just a lot more variations. This year started out kind of a little slow and a little late. The, the spring wasn't really early. It was late due to the cool weather. And then we've had wet weather and that's made the crop uh, difficult to take care of and maintain and difficult for the trees to get taken care of because of the wet weather. And the fungicides, we've had a big pressure of fungus because of the constant, constant, constant wetness um, that same wetness has made it tough to just be out in the orchard taking care of it. Most orchards have a store like this, but it's not a typical retail experience. Charles Bell brought two of his grandsons, Christian and Colin. We just live up there. We came in on the four wheeler. We're down here a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a neat place. Talk oh, about that a little bit. Yeah. 
we uh, uh, have lived on where we are now for almost 40 years, and so the orchard has been a big part of, of our growing up because the kids have all been coming down here from the time that they were uh, very young themselves. Our kids grew up here, and now these kids have grown up here. So it's just part of the part of the tradition of uh, who we are in, in this part of the this part of the county. Wayne and his wife Samantha met at Purdue and ran a small farm after they were married. We farmed a little, not a lot, and he saw where this was for sale and we got to looking at it thought, well, it was a, a, a good way to diversify. Agritourism was just starting back then. Okay, let's give her a whirl. And, no, I never thought I'd own an orchard. I mean, I like ag. I mean, I grew up in it, have an animal science degree, and that's my I mean, agriculture passion, but not, I didn't think I'd have an orchard. Every job has something about it that we love. What's a good day look like at the orchard? Well, a fun day is when I have a lot of people here and they're lined up all the way to State Road 36 and I have a lot of money at the end of the day. <laughs> Finally, that sense of community that's part of life in so many places. Think of the small towns where everybody knows everybody, where a youth baseball team's success turns into a parade down Main Street. This small town is Fairmount in Grant County, and there's something different here in recent years, something you can see in small towns seemingly all over the place. The people who have golf carts and drive them on the streets. In Fairmount, everywhere we looked, folks were riding around town in golf carts, in the city park, in neighborhoods, up and down Main Street. This goes back a ways. A state law passed in 2009 allowed golf carts on local streets as long as the cities or towns pass an ordinance to allow them. Some places allow them, many don't. In Fairmount, we ran into Heather Reno when she stopped downtown in her SUV to watch the baseball parade. We have tons of golf carts in here. I think everybody in town has a golf cart. I used to live in Gaston and they had, there were several people that had golf carts, but I think Fairmount has more golf carts per capita than any other small town in Indiana. There's, there's a bunch. Do people like them? Love them. That's it, as soon as the weather breaks, you see them out. Everybody, they start rolling out. They ever annoy people? I don't know anybody that gets annoyed by them because most of them have them. Almost everybody has one. We've got one. Who drives the golf carts? Kenny Wood, born and raised here, now sells kitchen cabinets. Guesses that 600 people in town may have carts. He's one of them. Well. Uh, sitting many evenings on the porch watching people go by on golf carts and it just seemed like after six o'clock um, we were missing out on all the action so to speak so um, I don't know it was just one of those things where we say well maybe we ought to get a golf cart you know so we did. In a smaller place where driving all the way across town to the city park is just a half mile ride carts make sense. You don't have to get in your car all the time. I mean, walking is great health, don't get me wrong, but you you know, you can hop in your golf cart and either go uptown, go to the park, um, go get some ice cream, you know, whatever you may want to do, and you don't have to get the vehicle out to do it. It's kind of like a moped, go-ped type of thing. The carts are slower, which you might think would irritate other drivers. Kenny says most of the cart drivers he's seen try to be polite. They have to have tail lights, headlights, mirror, reflective triangle, insurance, a $15 annual city permit, and maybe a small town sense of neighborliness. About six o'clock in the evening, <laughs> probably right after dinner, everybody hops, it just seems like everybody hops on their golf cart and takes a spin, you know? See what everybody else is doing, I reckon. Be uh, neighborly nibs, I reckon, but I mean, it's just a, Good way to get around town, see some, see some of the things. A basic cart can cost $2,500. Go for the extras and you could spend 10000 The value of friendships, priceless. Well, it's a small town, kind of come back to your roots type of thing. People know you, you know, it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable about things when you know who you're dealing with and who, who they are as well, you know. So roots, roots and families go quite a distance in Fairmount.
The neighbors you could run into would be retired GM worker Gordon Hoheimer and his wife Roberta, who bought their golf cart when everybody else seemed to be getting them. Usually you just ride around Fairmount in the evenings when, it, you know, when it's nice and the and, uh, sun's going down. And then we ride out to the old high school ever so often to see how much left of that's left out there. 60 years after James Dean's death, he still remembered fondly here. Gordon knew the future movie star when they were both in school. We played football at noon hour. You know, go out and, and James D Dean didn't play with us, but just one day he come out and he uh, was on my team. And he looked at me and he said, can you catch a football? And I said, yeah. So he was a quarterback naturally, a senior. He threw the ball and I dropped it. The seasons may change, leaves may fall, but the carefree spirit of summer doesn't have to change just because the calendar does. It helps to have the right frame of mind. <laughs> that, was it. that was my claim to fame with James Dean. <laughs> That's our show for today. Thanks for being part of it with us. Hope you'll join us next time as we find more stories off the beaten path from across the state on Indiana Weekend.